deaths per million people. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to see Dr. Modesena, who nowadays is the most influential theoretical physicist. He has started his journey back in Argentina, continuing his studies in the United States, where he's a professor at Princeton University. Uh, Dr. Modesena has made seminal contributions to string theory and quantum gravity. Back in 97, he has introduced the gas gravity duality and has been awarded with prestigious Prize in Quantum Physics in 2012. Hello, Dr. Maldacina, how are you? Hello, how are you? Very well. Uh, with me, I will introduce you to my co-host, uh, Michael Good, a uh, physics professor at Nazarbayev University. He will take over the difficult stuff of our interview. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it's great to have you here with us, uh, Professor Maldacina. Okay, wonderful to talk to you. Uh, I would like to start with, uh, with the first question. Um, first of all, the, the main goal of this interview is to inspire uh, young generations of scholars in Central Asia and Caucasus. So again, thank you very much. Uh, my first question will be, what inspired you to pursue Korean physics and academia? What drew you to this field? Um, when I was a child, my father liked to fix things in the house, fixing the washing machine, fixing the car, and I would help him. And this uh, inspired me to learn more about technology, how uh, everyday appli appliances work, uh, be it the washing machine, the car, the TV, etc. And by learning about that, I got interested in technology and in how technology uses the laws of physics. <clears throat> that made me interested in the laws of physics themselves. And was when I was um, ending my high school education, so before going to university, I read some popular physics books and it, they made me interested, more interested in physics. And I really, at the time, didn't know what uh, physics was like and what uh, a career in physics would be. Uh, so I decided to try it out, to try studying physics, uh, to see what it was like. And I, I liked it and I continued uh, studying physics. So I studied physics first in Argentina. And uh, then when I fini finished my undergraduate, I uh, came to the US uh, to do my PhD. And then I continued in the physics, academic physics career, which uh, consists of some uh, research positions and eventually uh, becoming a professor at the, at the university uh, where you teach and you also do research. That's great. Uh, so there are two pillars of modern physics, quantum theory of the world of the small, which describes atoms, light, elementary particles, and general relativity, which describes the world of the large, gravity, galaxies, cosmos. Um, how does your work help to reconcile these two pillars of modern physics, uh, just in general, you know, for, you, for the audience? Yeah, so... The, the, the idea that we want to reconcile it uh, becomes uh, important when we think about certain processes in the universe. Um, so for everyday physics, we can treat these two as somewhat separate, but uh, in the beginning of the Big Bang, it's important to treat them together because uh, matter was uh, very concentrated and the quantum effects or fluctuations or statistical fluctuations or quantum fluctuations of the matter were important and affected strongly the space-time. Um, and uh, it's basically, that's the main motivation for trying to understand uh, how to put these two together or to understand this problem of describing space-time in quantum mechanical language or quantum mechanical uh, terms. Now, uh, the work I've been involved and that many other people are pursuing also um, consists of uh, describing certain model universes, so universes uh, that do not have a big bang, but are still described by the laws of gravity, 
using uh, quantum theory, using uh, theories of quantum particles. And the central idea is that the very strongly interacting theories of quantum particles uh, can uh, develop their own space-time. They develop an emergent uh, uh, space-time um, that uh, has, is described by Einstein's theory of uh, relativity. Um, so in a way, somewhat similar to how uh, when you have uh, many, uh, let's say, molecules of uh, water, uh, they can um, they can develop uh, the surface of the lake, for example, of a water uh, surface. Um, at the level of the microscopic molecules, the surface is not very well defined, but at very long distances, we see a very clear surface where, for example, insects can walk on or the surfer can, uh, can surf on, etc. cetera. Um, the idea is that space-time is some, something somewhat similar to that, that is not fully well defined at very short distances, but takes its shape uh, when you look at it, at it at long distances. That's cool. So emergence is, so uh, you're very well known in the scientific community for, of course, the ADS CFT correspondence, this anti dissider conformal field theory correspondence. Can you maybe in as, uh, as a challenge, as as low technical jargon as possible, uh, describe the relevance of it for our de Sitter universe? Um, yeah, so the, this correspondence that we've been working on is for universes that do not expand. The, they are called, and, and, and that are curved. Um, they are called anti -de universes. That's just a technical name. Um, our universe uh, is expanding, so it's not of that kind. It's sometimes called the so but it's an expanding universe. Um, and the most uh, simple suggestion or possible application, though we don't understand the technical details, would be to think that um, there is some theory we can define at, let's say, the present moment uh, with, um, with particles and interactions that only exist at the present moment, uh, where the whole past history is embedded in, uh, in, in those particles and interaction and comes out of the, uh, those interactions. But the, the past history is not uh, really present in the fundamental description. So that uh, would be the, the simplest generalization, but this is a generalization that has not been understood in detail. But what has been understood in detail is the situation where the universe is not expanding. Okay, I see. So um, with respect to the holographic principle, which has gained a lot of attention recently, um, it's interesting to think about the universe uh, as a type of hologram. Can you comment on the holographic principle and its relationship to your work? Yes, so th this description I was mentioning before of describing gravity uh, in terms of the theory of particles has the peculiar feature that uh, the particles live uh, sort of at the boundary of the space, so on a, on a surface which was one dimension less than the full dimensions of space-time. So if we wanted to describe, let's say, our three-dimensional space, these particles will live on a sphere very far away. Um, it is as if uh, someone is looking at the crystal ball and there is uh, something going on uh, in the interior of the crystal ball, but everything is happening on the surface of the crystal ball. Um, and the name uh, holography derives uh, from optical holography, which is uh, a technique that uh, physicists have developed to uh, encode three-dimensional objects on two-dimensional photographic plates, where when you look at them, you see a three-dimensional object, even though the whole information is stored only in two dimensions. OK. Um, so you mentioned the idea of emergence. And uh, and I'm sure that the current work you're you're working on with uh, Dr. Pavlov and uh, Mr. Melikin uh, involving wormholes uh, is related to the idea of emergence. Um, but is there uh, is there any relationship to traversable wormholes or the idea that has fascinated the public with the ability to interstellar you know having interstellar travel? Can you comment on the likelihood of wormholes or um, how your work is related to traversable wormholes? Yeah, so wormholes are uh, particular space-time configurations that people have speculated about. And um, 
the in, in the science fiction literature, they usually are um, used to travel faster than the speed of light. So you enter one region and then immediately you come out in the other uh, position and you, they would allow you to travel faster than the speed of light. We, we think that such uh, wormholes uh, do not exist. They somehow violate some of the basic uh, principles of relativity. So early in the 20th century, um, there were some principles that we la were laid out. Uh, these are the principles of special relativity, general relativity, and quantum mechanics. And these principles have held on for, let's say, 100 years, uh, even though many new particles and new types of matter were discovered. So when we analyze nature, we think that we might discover new particles, such as when we discovered the Higgs boson or the top quark uh, recently. And, um, but all these particles that uh, have been created and that we expect to discover are, we normally describe them using matter that obeys those principles. And um, if you wanted a wormhole that where you can travel faster than the speed of light, you would have to violate those basic principles. Um, now, what is possible is uh, to have a wormhole where going through the wormhole would take longer than uh, going through the ambient space, at least as seen from someone from outside. However, the interesting uh, feature is that for the observer that goes through the wormhole, time slows down and um, and it could be that uh, the time it takes the observer to traverse the wormhole as felt by himself or herself is uh, much shorter. Uh, so for example, you could have uh, a wormhole where you traverse it in, let's say, one second. And from the point of view of someone who's sitting outside, uh, it's uh, 10,000 years, for example. Um, so those wormholes are not uh, possible with the particles. They require some matter that uh, is not part of the particles we've discovered so far. But they are still particles and uh, objects that obey the general principles uh, of relativity and quantum physics and uh, might possibly exist and have escaped detection. I don't think it's very likely that they exist, but at least they are possible with the general principles. So those are the things that are possible with the general physics principles that we know uh, today. And this, so we, we have uh, some example where, of a configuration where that is possible. Um, but uh, yeah, I, the, uh, I, 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 yeah. Yeah, not I entirely don't. pessimistic. Some possibility um, there. Well, there is some possibility. It requires many, many coincidences. So I'm, I'm not. Sure. I don't yeah. think it's likely. Uh, <laughs> should not bet on it. But I, I think it's yeah. interesting in in trying to explore. The, the main interest is in trying to explore what is possible with the general principles of quantum mechanics and general relativity, um, cool. because uh, there are some things that are not possible with those principles and. Uh, since we haven't discovered all the, the, the particles that exist in nature, uh, we have to keep an open mind in what, what is possible. Uh, That's true. And there's so much more potential still uh, to discover within those frameworks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, yeah. Do you have any more questions? No, I think that's, that's, that's very nice. nice. Okay, I will ask you uh, more general questions. I'm interested in since you've been uh, traveling to the United States to gain more knowledge, uh, do you think how collaboration with foreign colleagues helped your studies? Um, well, certainly I, I started my, my studies in Argentina. So it was uh, with uh, people in Argentina. And then, uh, of course, going to the US uh, helped me be in touch with uh, many more uh, leading scientists and uh, colleagues and so on, and that certainly helped me a lot in uh, in uh, developing my career and in learning new things. Um, and the physics community is uh, fairly international. There are people in uh, various countries, and uh, even uh, well in Europe and in in other countries. I have uh, colleagues in Argentina who are uh, still in Argentina and are still uh, doing uh, leading science and uh, internet very they're making important contributions to international science so if your question is uh, whether someone who is not in the let's say main let's call the main countries can contribute yes they can contribute in an important way 
And in your opinion, why international cooperation and knowledge transfer are important for the scientific development and discoveries? Well, I mean, the well, because you really can draw on a bigger pool of knowledge. So you, each person has uh, some limited access to uh, what they can imagine, what they can uh, think about. But by collaborating and talking to other people, uh, you have access to their points of view and their uh, specialized knowledge. And in this way, um, you can go much further. They can solve problems. They can help you solve problems you don't know how to solve. You can help them solve their problems. So the, the progress in science is not proportional to the number of scientists, but it's somehow a, a bigger power of the number of scientists. Maybe it's proportional to the square of the number of scientists. The scientific community doesn't have any borders, that it's something that, uh, especially now since the, uh, the outbreak of pandemic, you can actually collaborate uh, together, even though you're not present in the same uh, country. Yeah, Do you agree yeah, with that or disagree? Well, I agree that uh, now, the, the, despite the pandemic, we, uh, well, in fact, maybe thanks to the pandemic, we've developed better online tools to talk to each other and to have um, seminars. There are, for example, pre previously scientific talks would take place at the university or at some specific research location, but now they take place in cyberspace. They, uh, you know, you, you, can, you give a talk and anyone from the rest of the world can uh, come in into the Zoom call, for example, and uh, hear the talk, ask questions, etc. So that I think has uh, increased the the dissemination of knowledge. Because that wasn't as common before the pandemic. Now it's much more common. Yeah, yeah now it's much more common, and I, I think probably when uh, internet tools become better, it will become even. Uh, even better, I think. So that, I think, would be one of the beneficial aspects of this uh, terrible pandemic. And Michael actually said, said that he has, has been, been more productive <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, that's true. A for, a forced introversion, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that is true. So I think in some, in some things we are using our time more efficiently, and I think it, it's forced us to question how we do things, and I think that will be one good effect of this. Well, I think we're done with our questions. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, wonderful. So yeah. best wishes to you all. It's great to have your time and thank you so much. Sure. Thank See you, you later. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers.